You know, most of us will never wage war on a physical battleground, but we all find ourselves in, in battles in some sense. I mean, conflict is part of life in this fallen world, right? And uh, I don't know about you, but I think I came to that real, realization during recess at my elementary school, right? <laughs> Lots of conflict. And every playground has its bullies, right, who use intimidation to assert control and try to exalt themselves over a dodgeball game, over a swing set, or whatever it is. And um, one of the bullies at my school was a boy named Jason. And he was a tall kid, very athletic, brown hair in a bowl cut. It was the 80s, you know. Um, and he would swear at other boys and punch them in the arm and really kind of dare them to fight back, to take a swing at him. And once he even spat at me, you know. And I'd like to say that I stood up to him, but I never, I never did. Um, looking back, I think that Jason's obnoxious behavior stemmed more from fear because he had, a, he had a speech impediment and he struggled in class academically. And so all that bluster on the playground was probably an attempt to keep people from mocking him. Uh, now, I wish I would have realized that at the time. I think I, I, think it would have boosted my confidence uh, and kept me from cowering before him. Uh, now, I don't, I don't know what happened to to Jason as he grew up. But you know, some bullies just kind of keep expanding their sphere of control from school playgrounds to whole communities to corporations or even nations. And you know, as we continue this study of Isaiah's oracles to the nations, we find that God was using Isaiah to prepare his people to deal with some major bullies. Now, like we said last time, Isaiah's generation was facing intimidation from the Assyrian Empire. Uh, but in chapter 13, the funny part is the Lord reveals that an even bigger bully is coming uh, along later, the Babylonian Empire. And so hard times... It was clear hard times were going to come upon the people of Judah. And yet, uh, we, what we saw, especially as the end of chapter 13 leading into the beginning of 14, that God would ultimately fulfill his promises to bless them as a nation. But the Lord had more to say about Babylon. That's what we want to look at today. He must have thought that his people needed uh, more help for the rough road that lay ahead. And so in Isaiah 14, 3 through 27, the, and this is kind of funny, the prophet encouraged God's people that they will taunt the wicked king. And they'll do so with six truths. Right? They're not just, they're, it's not just a smack talk, right? It's not just put downs. These are truths that they're taunting him with. And so the whole idea is that the people needed to see through the intimidation from Babylon. They needed to recognize the ultimate weakness of their king, of that king. Now, Isaiah doesn't identify that king by name. Remember, he's, he's, he's living about 100 years before these events. And so the one who conquered Jerusalem in that future time was King Nebuchadnezzar. We learn a lot about Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. He's a main character there. But this passage we're going to look at here in Isaiah 14, the truths that Isaiah reveals, they extend beyond a single individual. Right? It seems to be broader than just Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, some statements are so lofty that they transcend what could be said of any human king's. Now, some people say, well, that's just po poetry, it's just hyperbole, but I think there's good reasons to conclude that Isaiah 14 is also describing the ultimate bully, right? The devil, Satan. 
Now, there's a similar passage like this over in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28. And Ezekiel was written during that time of Babylon, but it wasn't speaking about Babylon. Ezekiel was writing it about the the prince of Tyre, a city called Tyre. So it just raises the question, what's, what's the connection between these wicked kings at these different points in time and the devil, the prince of darkness? Well, we, we can say from a New Testament perspective, we know that Satan holds unbelievers captive to do his will. Jesus talks about that, so does the Apostle Paul. And then even when we look at the book of Revelation, we see that there will be a future world leader, an antichrist, who's directly under Satan's control. So I think it seems reasonable to conclude that as we look throughout history, Satan has used various world leaders in his efforts to oppose God's plans. So as we interpret this passage in Isaiah 14 or the one in Ezekiel 28, I think we have to keep in view both the human kings, and the evil one who controls them and uses them. So now what is that, how does that help us? Well, even though Isaiah 14 foretold Israel's victory over the earthly king of Babylon, I think its truths apply to the ultimate victory that God's people, that we will have over Satan. Right? The prince of darkness is our sworn enemy. He, he attacks us with temptation. He uh, discourages us through his control of the world and all that we see out there. And yet we can draw hope from these truths. We can use them to taunt the true wicked king. And so the first truth is this, that the earth will rest. You know how it is, when we, when we want to rest, have some time away, a lot of us head out to nature, right? We, we want to find that pristine forest glade or some secluded shoreline or a lofty mountain peak because we, we kind of think of those places as pristine, as pure, unspoiled by the world. But, I mean, you can't really escape sin, <laughs> the burden of sin that easily. Because right? corruption is always present because it's, it's within us, it's in our heart. But even nature itself, we know from Scripture that nature labors under the curse that God pronounced when Adam and Eve sinned. Right? The very existence of death and decay and sickness stems from that. And so these, those destructive effects that happened because of Satan's rebellion, his temptation against God, those are everywhere, but... We can take confidence in this truth that one day the earth will find true rest. Now again, as Isaiah is foretelling this future conflict with Babylon, he looks forward to the rest that his people will experience. Because Babylon would be defeated 70 years after they conquered Jerusalem. But the ultimate rest will come when God conquers all the forces of evil. So take a look at what the prophet wrote here in verses 3 through 6 of Isaiah 14. It says, When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service, service with which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has ceased. The insolent fury ceased. And then he says, The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers that struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows, that ruled the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. Now again, we have to ask, well, did the Jewish people experience rest from pain and turmoil and hard service when Babylon fell to the Medo-Persian Empire in 539 B.C.? Well, they were allowed to return to their land, but honestly, their pain and turmoil didn't stop. It's it's never stopped, right? We look to that part of the world, and the Jewish people have faced all sorts of, of difficulties and trials and persecution, right? Now, that, uh, that will not happen. They will not find true rest from all of that until all the 
wicked rulers are defeated, both earthly and demonic, because then, and only then, will there be true freedom and rest. And here's what Isaiah says here, when that time comes, nature will celebrate. Take a look at verses 7 and 8. It says, the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you. The cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. Now, Lebanon's to the north of of Israel, and and the the cedars there were a prime source of of good lumber uh, in that part of the world. And you may remember King Solomon used them in Jerusalem to build his palace and and the temple there. Uh, But conquering armies would also use them to build siege works. And so the end of Babylon, in a sense, provided some relief for those trees. But when the ultimate time of peace and rest comes, we get the sense that those trees will rejoice. Right now, there's other passages of Scripture that use that same kind of idea. Psalm 96, verses 10 through 13, calls the heavens to be glad, the earth to rejoice, the sea to roar, the field to exult, and the trees of the forest to sing for joy when the Lord comes to judge the world and to reign. Over in the New Testament, in Romans 8, 18 through 23, Paul talks about how creation has been groaning, waiting with eager longing because it's been subjected to futility, but that it'll one day be set free from its bondage to corruption when the sons of God are revealed in glory. And so all that to say this, don't lose heart in the struggle with this fallen world. Right? Because as we labor under the curse, we experience the temptation, the suffering, the death, and all that as a result of, of what Satan has done and continues to do in the world, we can live with this hope that one day there will be true rest. The second truth is that the dead will scoff. Now, in our secular world, people talk about death as sort of the ultimate rest. You know, our, our cemeteries are these serene gardens. I mean, I've even heard people suggest that those who have died get to enjoy those surroundings. And so when life gets difficult, some people think that's the way out, right? That's the escape. But you know, that's a wrong way of thinking. Dead people don't enjoy cemeteries, right? I mean, those places exist for our benefit. It's nice to have that. But at death, the soul is separated from the body. Right? The biblical truth is that believers pass directly into the presence of the Lord. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5.8, about being away from the body and at home with the Lord. But the souls of unbelievers don't get to share in that blessing. Now, we might assume, uh, the way we commonly talk, that that, someone who, that a lost person who dies goes to hell. Uh, the Greek word is Gehenna. But technically, that New Testament term refers to the, the lake of fire, the place of eternal punishment where unbelievers are sent after they're resurrected for the great white throne judgment. It talks about that in Revelation chapter 20. The New Testament uses a different word, Hades, to refer to the intermediate place where unbelieving souls go upon dying. Jesus talks about it in Luke 16, that story of the rich man and Lazarus. He talks about the rich man being in Hades, a place of torment. Now, these distinctions in the afterlife that we learned from the New Testament, those hadn't been revealed yet in, in the Old Testament. It, it just uses a more generic term, the Hebrew word sheol to talk about the place of the dead. And so here, Isaiah 14, 9 through 11, gives us some insight into torment that the the king of Babylon would face in Sheol. The dead will scoff at him. Here's what what it says, verse 9. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. Speaking to this king. 
It rouses the shades to greet you, all who were leaders of the earth. It raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. And then it says, all of them will answer and say to you, you too have become as weak as we. You've become like us. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, the sound of your harps. Maggots are laid as a bed beneath you, and worms are your covers. Now here again, a lot of people would read this and say, well, that's just a poetic way of saying that the king of Babylon will die like anyone else. And, and that thought is, you know, there is some comfort in that if you suffered oppression to think that this mighty king is not, you know, he's not immortal, that he will, uh, he will die. But the New Testament teaching about the afterlife that we've kind of talked about already a little bit, I think it allows us to interpret this description in a more literal sense, right? That this king will not just die, he'll suffer physical and even emotional torment as punishment for the way he lived, right? For his wicked deeds. He'll be humiliated, that justice will be served by that. So now does this passage give us, is there any connection, do we tie this into the future of Satan? Well, I think so. I think we can tie those together because Jesus seems to have drawn upon this passage in talking about eternal punishment, about hell, about Gehenna. Mark 9.48 tells us that he described it as where the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Well, the only other place where it talks about worms in relation to that is this passage we just read in Isaiah 14. And so we come to this, you know, hard truth that unless you're saved through faith in Christ, that's the destiny, the ultimate destiny of your soul. When we look at other passages in the New Testament, Matthew 25, Revelation 20, it indicates that the devil and his angels are destined for the same fiery eternal punishment. So here's the encouragement for us who are believers, as powerful as Satan may seem sometimes, he will be humiliated. He'll end up being tormented right alongside every unrepentant sinner who's ever lived. So don't cower in fear of the evil one. Stand firm in your faith. That leads us to a third truth here. The stars will recall. You know, if you get away from the bright city lights, gaze up into a clear night sky, the number of stars you can see is just breathtaking. In fact, as better telescopes keep being developed, more and more stars continue to be discovered, even in those patches of the sky that look completely dark. You know the scientific view or theories that a star is a massive collection of hydrogen atoms that radiate energy as they fuse together on a nuclear level? Um, And on on a few occasions, the Bible links stars with angelic beings. It's interesting. Now, the connection may simply be that stars serve as a good illustration, the idea that angelic beings are looking down upon us from heaven. But maybe there's something more to it. Isaiah uses the stars here to describe the lofty aspirations of this wicked king and the severity of his fall. It's like the stars stand as witnesses They've watched the whole story play out. And they'll recall it, recall his foolishness. Take a look here at Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. It says, How you were fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. And then I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. 
It says, but you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Now, the, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, but in the Latin translation, which had a lot of influence in church history, that word day star there was translated with the word Lucifer. Now, the word simply means brightness. That was what the Hebrew word meant. That's what the Latin word means. But when the translators of the King James Version came along, they decided to just keep that Latin word as if it were a proper name. So that's why you hear Satan referred to as Lucifer. It's not a proper name. It just means bright one. Right? The point of the passage is simply to say that this bright one, this particularly bright star, so to speak, wanted to rule over the other stars. Right, to become like God most high. But it ended up being cast down from heaven all the way to the deepest pit of Sheol, the place of the dead. Now again, you might look at that and say, well, it's just poetic language about the aspirations of a powerful human king. But again, uh, the, this terminology, this reference to stars, there are other passages that lead us to see this as pointing to Satan. Job 38.7 tells us that at the foundation of the earth, right, right as God was starting that first, those first acts of creation, it says the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Right, so you see stars and suns, this idea of beings that were around witnessing creation. Revelation 12.4 refers to a great dragon whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, right? And then further down in that chapter, verse 9, identifies that dragon as the ancient serpent, the devil, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, and it calls the fallen stars his angels. And we find even further confirmation of this connection in, in that Ezekiel passage, Ezekiel 28, I talked about earlier. Because there, the, the prince of Tyre is called an anointed cherub. That's another word for angel, an angelic being. Who was present in the Garden of Eden. And who, who was on the mountain of God. Right? But it says, because unrighteousness was found in him, he was cast down from the mountain. So I think we have to say that the one who influenced the king of Babylon and the prince of Tyre was an angelic being who led a rebellion against the Creator, who sought to exalt himself. Right? And, and so the idea that we're getting at here is, is the rest of the stars, right? the two-thirds that remained faithful to God, they know the story. They know his, as, his foolish aspirations that could never have been fulfilled. They know that his ultimate downfall is certain. His efforts cannot succeed. So we can draw strength and confidence and hope for the spiritual battle from that same truth. The stars know the story. They'll recall. At least to a fourth truth. The living will loathe. It's a word we don't use a whole lot, but to loathe, to look down upon, to be sort of disgusted. You know how it is you're walking along and you encounter an obstacle in your path maybe it's like a tree branch blocking a trail you might be able to go around it hop over it it's small enough you might just toss it aside but when you look back and you remember your journey you probably won't bother to think about that fallen branch right it just wasn't that big of a deal well isaiah has told us how the dead will scoff at the wicked king. He's looked at it from the perspective of heaven. The stars will recall his foolish aspirations. But what about those, what about the living? How will they respond? And that's where we get this. The living will loathe him. They'll conclude that he was just not that big of a deal. He was an obstacle, kicked aside. It's like they shrug and carry on with life. Take a look here at Isaiah 14, verses 16 through the first part of 20. It says, those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man 
who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home. And then it says, all the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb, but you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch, clothed with the slain, those pierced by the sword who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. And then it says, you will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have slain your people. Now again, to some degree, it seems like Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is, is in view here. Jewish tradition says that he was buried in a, in a fancy tomb, but that when the, the Persians came along, they dug up his body and uh, pierced it with swords. Um, now, I don't know how true that is. That's tradition. Uh, but we can say for certain there's no great monument to King Nebuchadnezzar in the world today. We don't know, even know where he was buried. Right? In that sense, he's a, a, an obstacle along the way. And the world moved on. Now, I suspect that those who get to spend eternity in the new heaven and earth will have similar feelings about Satan because we'll be in the presence of God. Right? Remember Revelation 21.4? It says he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. As formidable as the devil's power seems now, one day his influence will just seem like a forgotten obstacle. Right? Those who live forever will, will loathe him. They just won't give him that much credit. And so, though we, we talk in the New Testament about being aware of Satan, that he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, though we should be alert to his attacks. At the same time, we shouldn't be anxious that he will ever win the spiritual battle. He will be defeated. There's a fifth truth here. And it's, I'm just calling it the legacy will end, the legacy of evil. Evil influence spreads like contamination. You know, apart from God's intervention, uh, it just naturally passes from person to person, particularly in, in families. Wicked thoughts, selfish motives, they just tend to be unconsciously absorbed. And so part, another truth that's involved in taunting this wicked king is that his legacy will come to a complete and final end. Isaiah 14, starting in the middle of verse 20, reading down through verse 23, says this, May the offspring of evildoers nevermore be named. Prepare slaughter for his sons because of the guilt of their fathers, lest they rise and possess the earth, and fill the face of the world with cities. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts, and will cut off from Babylon name and remnant, descendants and posterity, declares the Lord. And I will make it a possession of the hedgehog and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord of hosts. Now we know that the dynasty of Babylon came to a complete end, right? Nebuchadnezzar's descendants. The, the legacy of that influence in the world was too destructive. And this, even the city was destroyed. It was wiped off the map, never to be rebuilt. So, again, I mean, that, that passage seems to focus more on the earthly king. Is there a connection? Is there a tie into the work of Satan? I mean, he doesn't have literal offspring. He's an angelic being. But, you know, as Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees, John 8, 44 tells us that he said... You're of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
So there is a sense in which the devil has a legacy in the world, right? His influence has this contaminating effect as it spreads. And so Satan's, as we've seen already, Satan's not the only one who'll be excluded from the new heaven and earth. Every unrepentant sinner will share that fate. Everyone who is like Jesus called the the Pharisees a child of the devil. And yet, the good news is that no human being is stuck in that evil family tree. Because you can be born again through faith in Christ. Because you can be adopted into the family of God to have an inheritance in eternity. And so, yes, Satan's legacy will end, but the children of God will reign with him forever. And so that leads to one final truth from this passage. Sixth, that God's purpose will stand. We as human beings have this amazing ability to create stories. Right? Sometimes it's just simple ones, right? Like, like the stories in a children's book. But other times you see what other authors write and it's, they create complicated tales with a variety of lifelike, believable characters, vivid settings, and intertwining plots. Right? And with a good author, each detail contributes to that whole story. Now, of course, people have that ability, even those who don't know the Lord, we all have that ability because we're made in the image of God. He's the true storyteller. And yet his tale is far more complex. Every living being is one of his characters. Right? He enables us to make real choices. But he's still able to weave every action together to tell the story that he wants to tell. And so whatever hardship we encounter along the way, we can trust that God's purpose is being accomplished. That it will stand. Now, the oracle that God gave to Isaiah here, like we've said, it focused on the Babylonian king and his empire, even though the Babylonians wouldn't come along or wouldn't rise to prominence for another century. And so remember the immediate threat facing Isaiah's countrymen in the kingdom of Judah was the Assyrian empire. So as this oracle concludes here, Isaiah 14, 24 through 27, God clarifies the purpose. It's like he's saying, well, this is why I'm telling you all about Babylon. It's that if God can preserve the people of Judah through that attack that's coming and that powerful kingdom, then he can certainly deal with the Assyrians. Here's what Isaiah wrote. Verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and on my mountains trample him underfoot, and his yoke shall depart from them, and his burden from their shoulder. And then he says, this is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations, for the Lord of hosts has purposed. And who will annul it? His hand is stretched out. Who will turn it back? Like we said last time, God's story defines the rise and fall of nations. It includes the rebellion of angels led by Satan that were cast out of heaven. And their best efforts to frustrate his plans are just woven into the plot. Every detail in our lives plays into it too. And so whatever circumstances we face, we can trust that God is working all things together to accomplish his good and perfect purpose. So be encouraged. Though we face a wicked king, we can taunt him with these truths. 
that one day the earth will rest from his influence. And it'll all be restored to the way that God meant it to be. One day the dead will scoff. This is the guy, this is the being who thought he could do battle with God? The stars will recall the angels, his foolish aspirations. Those of us who live in eternity will loathe his memory. His destructive legacy will come to an end and God's good purpose will stand forever. So what role do you play in the story? Are you still enslaved to that wicked king? Because Christ came to set us free. Right? You can ask him to, to rescue you, to, to free you from the domain of darkness. You can be born again as a child of God by trusting in him. So if you've never done so, I encourage you to take that step, to look to the Lord. If you want to learn more about how the Son sets us free, I think the eighth chapter of John's Gospel is a good chapter to consider, to spend some time reading. And if you're a believer, are you standing firm against the attacks of the evil one? Don't let him bully you into a sinful way of life. Right? Draw strength in knowing that his power is limited and his downfall is certain. Recommit yourself to, to standing firm in the gospel of Christ. Maybe you have a friend, someone you know, someone you care for who's caught up in doing the, the will of Satan, right? held captive by him. Because that's the standing of everyone who's not trusting in Christ. We have to realize that. And if so, would you, would you speak the words of truth, right? the good news of the hope we have in Christ, that gentle correction that, to someone that says, you don't have to live this way. You can be set free. May we stand firm in the grace of God.